none of our first seven presidents belong to a church upon becoming president of this country. America was not founded as a Christian nation. George Washington was a deist. He denied the resurrection and divinity of Jesus. So, I mean, this is hardly an Orthodox Christian. So let's look at our second president. John Adams was an early Unitarian. He denied the Trinity, he denied the divinity of Jesus. Okay, well, let's turn to the third president. Jefferson, again, was a deist. He was not a Christian. In fact, he had some really anti-Christian comments. Benjamin Franklin, um, one of our founding fathers, a deist. John Quincy Adams, our sixth president of the United States, who was a Unitarian, refused to take his oath of office on a Bible, insisting instead that he place his hand on a book of U.S. law. Read the Declaration of Independence. There's not one mention of Jesus Christ in the Declaration of Independence. When there is a reference to God, it's usually in the impersonal terms of the deists. You know, nature's God, quote unquote. Uh, their creator, quote unquote. The supreme judge of the world, quote unquote. These were catchphrases of the deists. The idea that America was founded as an explicitly Christian country is an article of faith in some circles. The Fox News host Glenn Beck has dedicated entire shows to it. When they looked at all the writings the founders used and relied on and quoted, the most quoted source was the Bible. So is this argument correct? Mainstream historians say no, that if you look at the early documents, including personal letters, it's very clear that the founders did not want to make Christianity the official religion. The founders left out any mention of God or Jesus in the Constitution, except when they noted the date in the year of our Lord, 1787. And then in the First Amendment, they specifically outlawed the establishment of any state religion. And by the way, Thomas Jefferson, the man who wrote in the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, he was a deist, not a Christian, meaning he believed that God created the universe but no longer intervenes in human affairs. Interestingly, however, many people believe that by not making Christianity the official religion, the founders created a dynamic and competitive atmosphere in which faith has thrived, making America one of the most religious developed countries on earth. Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. When people talk about the fundamental freedoms enshrined in the American Constitution, this is what they're talking about, the First Amendment. The fundamental freedoms guaranteed under Islamic law are not far from these American ideals. And that's amazing when you realize the Quran predates the Constitution by a thousand years. Amongst the founding fathers, one of the greatest, Thomas Jefferson, had his own Quran in full acknowledgement of Islam's contribution to world civilization. And there's evidence in Washington that suggests America knows it's indebted to Islam for its own citizens' inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, as well as laws that are passed by Congress and official treaties, which the United States has entered into. And with that in mind, there's one treaty in particular, the 1797 Treaty of Tripoli. Now, this treaty was drafted when George Washington was still president. This treaty was unanimously approved by the United States Senate and was signed by President John Adams, our second president. Now, what makes this treaty so special in terms of our present discussion is the 11th article. And again, let me just read it verbatim. Article 11 as the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, 
as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Muslimen, Muslims, and as said states never entered into any way or act of hostility against any Mohammedan nation. It is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. Morocco being the first country to acknowledge America's freedom and independence back in 1787, I believe, um, there was a peace treaty. Um, with this peace treaty, they, uh, they established a friendship. Now, some of the signatures on that peace treaty was Thomas Jefferson and, uh, and John Adams, uh, some of the founding fathers of, of this country. And they had a relationship with many of these North African countries. Morocco the first country to recognize the United States after the achievement of American independence has long been regarded with friendliness and respect by the people of the United States. and a lot of Americans will benefit from this knowledge was the attitude of the founding fathers to other religions to the notion of religious pluralism which is what America is all about Washington reached out to Muslims specifically and mentioned uh, the name Islam for, uh, for immigrant communities that are welcome in America John Adams called the prophet of Islam one of the greatest truth seekers of history up there with Socrates and Confucius. That Benjamin Franklin called him a model of compassion. That Jefferson owned a copy of the Quran, and we all know that famously now, and hosted the first iftar at the White House. And Ramadan is a reminder that Islam has always been a part of America. The first Muslim ambassador to the United States from Tunisia was hosted by President Jefferson, who arranged a sunset dinner for his guests because it was Ramadan, making it the first known iftar at the White House more than 200 years ago. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson's writing uh, is absolutely magnificent. And when he wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. That was the first time anybody had bothered to write that down. And then you turn the clock back and think of when he was writing, how young he was, what a statement it was given the history of the world at that point. And you feel the excitement of being on the cusp of something so profound that it's hard to put it into words. This is the Supreme Court in Washington. But what I wanted to show you is a freeze which is in the room where the Chief Justices actually sit and dispense justice. This freeze pays homage to the ideas and principles that have inspired the American legal system. And one of the foundation documents represented in this freeze is the Quran. The Thomas Jefferson Building contains the Library of Congress, the oldest cultural institution in Washington, which was completed in the 19th century. Around the dome of the reading room is a mural meant to represent the nations and ideas that contributed most to American civilization. Amongst the ideas represented here is Islam. Beneath this great mural, I'm meeting Congressman Keith Ellison. Keith, tell me about when you took your oath of office, because it was on a copy of the Quran and not just any copy. Well, in fact, it was on this Quran that we have right here before us. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, this Quran, which is a two-volume set, mm -hmm. has the initials uh, T.J. inscribed right here, Thomas Jefferson. And so, you know, we, we said this what is... What was your a... reaction when you found out that one of the founding fathers had his own copy of the Quran? Right, I was gobsmacked. 